think a lot about Grand Theft Auto, and not just for this video, ever since I've been playing the games. They started for me as this unachievable thing, reserved only for the grown-ups of the world. By the time San Andreas was hitting store shelves, I was far too young, at least according to Mr. and Mrs. OZ, to be playing such a heinously ostentatious video game. I remember my brother telling me that GTA 4 got a 10 out of 10 on IGN and thinking to myself, there's not a thing on this planet I want more than to play Grand Theft Auto 4. It was, for me, the ultimate coming of age opportunity. Playing Grand Theft Auto would be the crossing of the threshold into adulthood that would make puberty look like any old day of the week. My dad graciously offered to go to the store and purchase it for the Xbox 360, as long as I didn't tell my mom. He had no idea what you could do in that game. That day, that moment I launched GTA 4, my dad in the room watching over and hearing a BDSM-fueled sexual escapade as the very first words muttered in that game, it's left an indelible mark in my mind forever. Somehow, I got to continue playing. I'm not sure if the game ever grew up to the absurd expectations I had for it, but it certainly occupied a lot of hours for little old David. Fast forward to my freshman year of college, and I'm at the midnight release for one Grand Theft Auto V, a swan song of the Xbox 360 era of gaming. The reason I bring up all of this is because I have this running theory, this theory that Grand Theft Auto V, of all godforsaken video games, might be the reason I began to think more critically about games, think more philosophically about the implications of an interactive medium, blah blah blah. Grand Theft Auto V very well might be the reason this YouTube channel exists. How so? It's all thanks to my university philosophy professor, a man that I respected so much it bordered on embarrassment. I've spoken with him a number of times about all things moral, about abortion, about torture, about every single college-age philosophy thought experiment you could possibly think up. We've waxed philosophically about the implications of using violence, about the existence of an objective morality. One day, during one of our conversations, he asked if I had tried out the new Grand Theft Auto game. I said, yeah, I've been playing it some. Why? Do you have it? He said, hell yeah, I love it. I go out of my way to run the people on motorcycles over because it makes me laugh every time they go flying. This exchange will never leave my mind. This is a man who has spent decades studying what is right and wrong, what is meaningful and what is arbitrary. He had an absolute commitment to uncovering what goodness in the world meant. And he still went out of his way to run people on motorcycles over because it made him laugh hysterically. Now I'm sure all of you understand that these murderous video game actions, these manslaughters that in any other context would have you locked away and seen as a sociopathic murderer, are not indicative of anyone's moral alignment or ethical standing in the world. They are fake, and do not act as an indictment of your ability to live responsibly in reality. But this wasn't always an agreed-upon idea, and it certainly wasn't seven years ago. Hearing this authority on the subject speak like this sent my mind into a whirlwind. How could he justify that? How could this nuanced thinker find such adolescent humor in repeatedly running over people? Doesn't he see how patently immoral it is to do that? All thoughts of a college student who recently discovered Kant, sure, but it was how I felt nonetheless. It occurred to me in that moment that one can live a truthful, motivated, and morally appropriate life, all the while being completely interested in, and even taking joy in, seeing how many innocents you can bounce off your bumper before ultimately being gunned down in what would, in reality, be seen as one of the most devastating terrorist attacks in history. In GTA, though, you're just trying to get five stars for as long as you can. And that's okay. Again, I know that it may seem obvious to you now. However, hearing about this my whole life, that video games make you violent, that my parents were saying that it is bad for me to be so violent in a game, it was incredibly liberating to hear a moral authority say it's not such a big deal. It was a vital step on my way to understanding the influence and nuance of the interactive medium, or heck, maybe even understanding the lack of nuance in the medium. I still always go out of my way to hit the bikers too, just to say thanks. But if you wanted an in-depth conversation about the implications of violence in video games, then I'm afraid this video is not that. Please watch Lamhoot's video on exactly that, it's awesome. While violence and moral depravity is certainly a fundamental pillar on which GTA rests on, 
I don't think explaining why vehicular manslaughter being okay is sufficient for a game that takes on so many different approaches to interactivity. So with this game, I'm excited to conclude the long-running series on my channel called The Book of Rockstar Games. Grand Theft Auto V is game 5 of 5 of the contemporary Rockstar games I've analyzed. I will have written almost 60,000 words about these games, which at this point literally adds up to a book's length of thoughts and musings on some of gaming's most influential titles. I don't expect you to have listened to all of those videos, and while I do think that they are important to our understanding of GTA V as a whole, I will say that this video is going to be a hair different than those. The main reason is that this is my least favorite game of the five I've covered, by a significant margin. More than anything, Grand Theft Auto V really made me appreciate Red Dead Redemption 2, which I am also in the process of replaying for this video. When you play these two games side by side, you can almost hear the writers apologizing for some of the writing in Grand Theft Auto V through the writing of RDR 2. Almost every shortcoming in GTA V's thematics is addressed in RDR 2 and it is stunning to me how much more artistically focused and thematically centralized Red Dead is as compared to GTA V. Now obviously the two have wildly different artistic objectives. It also accomplishes the same for Grand Theft Auto IV, which is far from as delicately crafted as Red Dead 2, but still makes GTA V look like a series of social commentaries thrown into a washing machine turned on full blast. In that sense, GTA V has this hilariously unintended effect of making every other Rockstar game look better in comparison, at least in the aesthetic and thematic department. I do, however, think that there's a lot to be said about the ways in which Grand Theft Auto V succeeds as a video game. Its absolutely massive commercial success is not undeserved. I do not think it is a bad video game, despite it being my personal least favorite. So I assure you this video will not be an all-too-long negativity party. There's a good deal to celebrate about GTA V, even in 2020. I have a lot to say about this game. I feel a lot of things about Grand Theft Auto V, and much like the game itself, this video will have to confront a wide gamut of abstract, philosophical, and political topics of conversation. This video will be structured similarly to the Grand Theft Auto IV video, insofar that I will not be analyzing the story beat by beat, but instead speaking about the wider thematic approaches to the game's world, characters, and gameplay. I want to begin the video with a conversation on my broader thoughts on the game as a whole, then focus in on the characters after that. Because here is one of the most important things to our understanding of these games. If there's one thing you should take away from this video, it's that the statements that GTA 4 made about, say, advertising or the American dream, exist wholeheartedly in this game as well, only turned up to the limits of absurdity. More on that later. It's because of that that I think my GTA 4 video is important viewing for the full experience of this one, in that a good majority of this analysis uses GTA 4 as a comparison point to a lot of the failures and successes of the fifth game. I also kind of think that video is pretty good still. My name is David Oz, and I am really looking forward to speaking about all the ways in which GTA 5 gets my gears turning. I make videos looking at the ways in which games make thematic, literary, or cultural statements in their writing and gameplay. I will not be looking at this game's story, at least in the sense that I won't be recapping its moments or talking about plot holes or each mission individually. I want to speak about how this game presents its themes and world in both incredible and not-so-incredible ways. Oh yeah, here's your spoiler alert, but I mean, come on. Timestamps can be found in the description below. This is part 5 of the 5-part book of Rockstar Games. I'm excited. Here's what I love about Grand Theft Auto V, and Grand Theft Auto games as a whole. Games writers and other fake intellectuals like myself have always been talking about this idea of a power fantasy, so much and for so long that it has taken on sort of memefied properties. I think most people get it at this point. But I'm going to talk about it anyway, but not in the way that I think it is normally talked about. Sure, the game allows you to do powerful feats of humanity that would absolutely be impossible to anyone. One can parachute into a military base, steal a jet, and joyride around a California sunset for hours upon hours in GTA V. That is absolutely a power fantasy. But I think that GTA V does something a little more subtle than that, something that rests under the umbrella of those traditional forms of power fantasy. GTA V allows for the utter destruction of social contracts, the total subversion of everyday inadequacies. 
GTA 5 allows for the sheer catharsis and joy of driving around a Los Angeles freeway unimpeded, going about your commute without the frustration of being sandwiched between bumpers. It takes the daily frustrations of life that build like straws on a camel's back, and it lifts them from you. You aren't waiting in lines. You aren't grocery shopping or eating. You don't have to worry about the food, medicine, and ammo of your camp. You aren't going to the bathroom or needing to sleep. You, the player, and by extension its playable characters, aren't worried about having enough money to purchase something. You want that car? Buy it. Better yet, steal it. It is the sort of power fantasy I look forward to as an adult. And in this sense, I hope it illustrates a bit better some of my frustrations with my first playthrough of Red Dead Redemption 2, and how its systems bordered on reality a little bit too closely. Take this for example. I take the interstate home every day to and from work. I get stuck in traffic. I have to always make sure the chores are done and the bills are paid and the house has food. There is something so specific to video games that allow me to break free from those responsibilities and speed down the highway into the oncoming lane. I am confident in saying that almost everyone who has experienced the soul-sucking monotony of a highway commute, like the ones frequently found in Los Angeles, have had fleeting thoughts of, man, I know I could just hop into the shoulder of the highway here and speed by everyone. I, I bet my car could shoot that gap. I wonder if I could fit underneath that semi-truck. Of course, we never do it. Okay, well, I hope you don't. I've seen one too many live leak videos of cars careening off of medians to know it's best to sit my butt down and throw on a podcast. But we have the thought. We have the part of us that thinks, given the opportunity or the lack of real-world consequences, we could pull it off. That is what GTA gives me. That is the power fantasy that I think rests below the entire experience. The ability to navigate, both literally and figuratively, around the social contracts and expectations of 21st century existence. It's what makes these games so special, and what makes video games such a medium-specific joy to partake in. I know that this all sounds a little highfalutin, pretentious analysis stuff, because sure, the shooting and blowing up stuff is fun. It is explicitly and kinesthetically enjoyable. However, I think even if you don't explicitly acknowledge the fantasy I am talking about here, its effects ring true for all players. I often see how far I can go by following proper road rules such as stoplights and signs, turn lanes and speed limits. I mean, we've all done this, let's be real. We do this because of this very topic I'm speaking about here. It grounds us back into the reality. So often games writers talk about the ways in which games gamify death, how they increase the tension in their gameplay loops by adding in tangible, difficult, and sometimes even annoying ramifications for mistakes or missteps. Maybe GTA 5's most thematically consistent ludonarrative synchronicity, oh god, is that there really are little to no consequences for your mistakes, for your deaths, for your genocidal maniacal bullet tantrums. The game encourages you to try. It encourages you to fling yourself off of ramps and cliffs and blow things up because you aren't really losing anything at all once you inevitably blow yourself up in the process. You can perish in the most horrifically catastrophic way imaginable, and still step outside a local hospital as if nothing happened to you, least of all you suffering any significant gameplay or fin financial consequences. Think about all those times that you committed countless murders, escape the grasp of the police, hide away in an alley somewhere, and your stars disappear. You are free from the law. You can leave your alley and immediately pass by a police officer that was just chasing after you with reckless abandon. They won't notice, care, or pay you any attention. The world in GTA V is as uncaring and deliberately nihilistic as the player characters themselves. Compare this to Red Dead Redemption 2 and you can see a perfect illustration of the drastically different thematic and interactive objectives that each game are trying to achieve. Red Dead's more self-serious grounded tone has you having to pay off bounties that exist in a world where the people, the law, remember your name, your horse, what you have been wearing and will have eyes out for you long after the initial chase is over where Red Dead 2 asks you to consider the humans in a game where spit from Thomas Downs has catastrophic implications across a 60-hour story. GTA asks you to consider the ways in which you would react if there truly were no consequences for your in-game actions. It's that juxtaposition, that tangible difference between the hell of the body-strewn streets of Los Santos and the far too serious reality of the consequence-filled homes of our real lives that makes Grand Theft Auto V so compelling as an interactive experience. 
It's made doubly effective in the ways that the game world contributes to the idea that it is a world that people live in already, that you also happen to live in, instead of being a world that was designed to be in a video game. Look, whether you want to phrase it out so collegiately or not, the truth still stands. Grand Theft Auto V succeeds as a game because of the lack of real-world consequences. It succeeds, periodically, as an art in the ways it combines the consequence-free actions of its world design and characters with the consequence-free actions of the player in the open world. The gross, abhorrent advertising plastered about the world, the free reign of the federal government to perform extrajudicial assassinations and meddling, the rampant crime lords that exist with relative impunity in the world all beg the player to ask, how in the world does anyone get away with this stuff? The world and story of GTA supplements its gameplay by being, at least at first, as consequence-free and absurd as the player's actions. And when the game challenges that notion is when the most potent narrative moments land. So let's talk about that, because not only does it absolutely connect the game's gameplay to its thematic and narrative objectives, but it will really inform the way we look at the three individual player characters later on in this video. GTA's most frustrating and yet undeniably thematically consistent motif is this nihilistic idea of throwing your arms up in acceptance of the fact that nothing matters whatsoever. Time and time again, the game confronts you with this idea that one should just resign themselves to the tick-tock of the clock, because it cares for no one, certainly not the depraved souls of our trifling triumvirate. Look, in the immortal words of Run the Jewels, a wise man once said, we all dead, f*** it. If that isn't the motivating terminology for the world and characters of Grand Theft Auto V, then I don't know what is. And it informs and engenders the motivations of the player as well within the world, especially in the last story mission. Consequence-free play is not just a game design decision, as much as I think it is a successful one, but it's a culture and a mood that the game deliberately wants you to think about, whether or not that's a good message to spread. It really is the most depressing aspect to the characters of these games, and it is one of those things where if you think too hard about it, it'll bum you out a bit. Sometimes when I get bored of the story missions and I start gunning down civilians or police to see how many stars I can accrue, I think to myself, this is so gamey, this is so out of character and non-canonical. Then I think a bit harder, and as mentioned before, get a bit sadder. Because it isn't that hard to imagine Trevor and Michael specifically being one or two mental breaks away from doing exactly what you are doing in your blood-fueled rampages. Somehow, some way, Rockstar managed to make an absurd open-world mayhem simulator not so canonically dissonant. That's kind of exciting to me. Because GTA V succeeds as a canvas to experiment upon. That is how it will be remembered. And praised. Not as a riveting expression of the human existence, thematically or narratively, but as a just convincing enough representation of real-world Americana that it can supplement each player's wildest, most depraved imaginations. How far can I send a sports car off a cliff? How many police can I gun down before I myself am gunned down? Is there really that much mental gymnastics to imagine Trevor doing any of those things? And I think the developers slowly recognize this. If anyone knows their game, it's the people that have been working on it for the last decade. That's not an exaggeration, by the way. If the game came out in 2013, we can assume it was in development long before that. To this day in 2020, it is still receiving content updates frequently, none of which have been single-player campaigns like that which we saw for GTA 4. To me, this is evidence indicative of the thematic and artistic objectives of GTA 5 as a whole. The game serves to tell social and emergent stories, stories that happen in its online modes that are created amongst players, friends, Discord servers, live streams, and total strangers. It's really fascinating to look at the ways in which GTA V has defined what it means to be an open world game, with roleplay servers being created and entire stories being crafted solely around this idea of consequence-free emergent play spaces. You can use this empirical evidence as the foundation to understanding the core differences between this game and GTA 4, which received two great DLC story campaigns. One game intended to express itself through spiraling crime dramas and self-serious characters. The other intends to express itself through world design and opportunity and gameplay. It's why I think the game, overall, will be remembered fondly despite me finding so many issues with the way it presents its story and thematics. The game will live on positively for years and years, 
especially with the care and attention it is getting in terms of updates. However, its story and characters, its writing and motifs, will become more and more outdated and difficult to interpret the further and further time gets from 2013. So let's go ahead and quit the broader analysis here and get into the specifics of the game itself, and why it is my personal least favorite of the five I've covered, at least in terms of what this channel is concerned with. You know that moment when someone says something that is intended as a joke and no one really reacts? The joke wasn't necessarily harmful or inappropriate, just didn't really land. And then they repeat it, or build on it because the person didn't think anyone heard them? Yeah. GTA 5 made me relive that uncomfortable moment time and time again, over and over. I think there's a good reason GTA 5 is the last game I cover in the book of Rockstar Games as well, despite not being the most recent Rockstar game released. I will argue that GTA V acts as the proverbial tipping point of the Rockstar formula, in my opinion, at least as far as the writing goes. It was when the series decided to see how far it could go if it decided to push every single boundary. The game decided it wanted to take on everything. It wanted to take on a bigger open world, more characters, more systems. It wanted to tackle a bleeding heart liberals and rural republicans. It wanted to simultaneously be the extreme of the genre, be the biggest and loudest entry into the open world market, while also taking on the extremes of Americana. The hypocrisy of the writing hilariously matches the hypocrisy of its characters, and I guess the chasm, or the hairline fracture, between liking this game and disliking it is whether or not you believe that was intentional or not. Unfortunately, that is the key issue I have with GTA V as a piece of rhetoric, something it is absolutely striving to be. GTA V wants to be a lot of things. It wants to posture itself as both intellectually middle-grounded and reasonable, but also devoid of responsibility through the guise of satire. Unfortunately, GTA V, more often than not, kills the joke. Because let me be clear, I do believe this sort of intellectual purity through abstinence of choice is not impossible. I just think GTA V sucks at it. Look, I'm going to take this video to do my once and for all stance and message on this topic of politics and video games. You've all heard it discussed, certainly in regards to this game, and I'm not going to evangelize my opinion to you. I'm going to ask you to look at the topic differently. Most of you watching this know me. You know my channel. You know I fight for representation, for responsible, moral, progressive characters in stories and games, blah blah blah. I hope most of you know me as a reasoned and open-minded person, but let's be real, it would probably not be hard for you to guess where I land on the political spectrum. That being said, if you've ever said to yourself, keep your politics out of my video games, or that games are overly political, or that they are too concerned with social agendas, you might be surprised to know that I can understand where you're coming from. I don't agree, especially after years of writing on games and pondering these things, but I can sort of sympathize with you. It simply comes down to the idea of, what are you buying when you purchase a game? Is it a toy? A product? Are you looking to escape? Does every piece of media in our lives have to be tied to politics in some way, somehow? This is especially relevant to a game like this, that demands you confront the meaninglessness of the world's culture and actions, the moral depravity of society at large, and the nihilism of trying to live a faultless life. A game that, as we've mentioned, is about breaking free of the real-world responsibilities and social expectations placed upon us every day. I celebrated that aspect of the game earlier, so what's my problem with it now? It's because GTA V is not at all politically abstinent. It isn't at all centralized in its ideology. It is meandering and non-committal, sure, but more than anything it says too much about politics and social issues. It has something to say about every single political or social issue one can reasonably think of for 2013 Americana. Feminism? Plenty of that. Wealth inequality? My goodness, yes. Race relationships, abortion, the 1%, sex workers, judicial overstepping, Hollywood's abuse problems, the police state, Second Amendment lunatics and detractors, legalized marijuana and torture. It isn't saying nothing about politics. It's saying as much as it possibly can in its runtime. It's like they decided to fit the last decade of South Park's commentary into one video game. It isn't awakened enlightened centrism as much as it is avoiding responsibility through misdirection. It isn't an intellectually centered libertarianism as much as it is a hodgepodge of political stances tossed into a blender, as if to say, we have nothing to say by saying everything there is to say. 
And while I believe that it has a center-right lean in its commentary, there is plenty of criticism of both sides to conveniently deny any sort of political responsibility. It's why the humor just fails in every single way for me. It is far too broad a spectrum. There's no authorial focus, no handhold to latch onto. It is whiplash from one social commentary to another. Every joke about cell phone reliance or inbred country folk felt more like an email chain from my grandmother than an actual funny joke. Look, I understand wholeheartedly that, to a degree, humor is subjective. I can confidently say that I didn't think that this game was funny. It was Facebook-level social commentary that never noticed for 30 hours that we already heard you say the joke the last time. We just didn't react. And while one could probably make a whole two-hour video looking into how the game's jokes about radical feminists or Starbucks drinking white privilege or delusional tech bros lack any sort of real humor in 2020, I actually will hold myself back a bit, I know. Most can acknowledge that, just like Apache helicopter jokes, these things just haven't really aged well. But I do not joke when I say that it is just a complete tidal wave of jokes about everything. The back of the box description of its jokes might say, nothing is off limits in this game, as if it was an endorsement, when in reality it's unfortunately completely true of the game, where anything that can be joked about will be. A lot. In most other games or media, the humor not working wouldn't be an existential problem to whether or not the media works as intended. But unfortunately, GTA V lives and dies thematically by its humor. The satire and commentary on society is the core of its narrative objective. And if it fails at that, what else is left? For my place. All right, relax. I was just being sarcastic. Yeah, well, don't be, all right? Because the world doesn't need any more sarcasm. It's the blight of the age. Not a ton. So you may ask, why does GTA 4's satire work for me? At least work better than GTA 5. I think it's because of the contrast. The contrast of the absurd with the melodrama of Nico's story and demeanor. Nico is taken seriously. His environment is not. It's actually a criticism I see frequently of the game that I don't subscribe to at all. I think that's part of the rhetorical success of GTA 4, that it is a game about perspective in America and how different people with different backgrounds see the country differently. GTA asks you to consider America and its culture from the perspective of an outsider, of someone who might actually see it in the robust, awful, and eccentric ways it is portrayed in a GTA game. And this just isn't afforded to us in GTA 5, at least not as clearly as it is in 4. Michael, Trevor, and Franklin are all denizens of California, all natives to the perverseness of American culture. You don't get that contrast, that juxtaposition of the serious and the absurd that creates the whirlwind in which GTA 4's satire works. All you get is the absurd. Nothing else to complement it or compare it to. And just absurdity does not a satire make. When the story attempts serious conversations about family, about loyalty or betrayal, it suffers because of the piles, the mountains of jokey fluff that it has to find footing on. There is never a moment in which you can definitively say whether or not a moment is intended to be serious or laughed about. I can't control things, and then, you know, shit just falls on top of me, my life sucks right now, and I don't know what to do, except I want to say I love you and hug it out, but all that wimpy shit is just... Well, I'd say gay, but I have some friends who are gay, so that's not cool anymore, and the ones that I don't really like, it's not because they're gay, so... Lame, all right? You are just a lame and angry psycho sometimes. You do bad shit and things. I don't know if I love you, and I'm pretty sure I hate you a little bit, but I'm just so fucking upset that we can't even see each other. And you're just a drunk, lame dad. You know what? That might just be the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. So will you buy me a car? What? I mean, not in the so will you buy me a car kind of way, in a completely off topic, can you buy me a car? I mean, firstly, I'm a, a fat shit that you ruined. And, and secondly, I will get a job and I will stop smoking pot in that sort of way, okay? I love you too, son. And trust me, I understand that this may be exactly what you appreciate about these games. That is the hairline fracture I spoke about before. Again, this is just my issue with the game as a text, as a piece of rhetoric as seen individually by me from my criticism lens. This is not to speak on the ways in which I celebrated the game's indifference and nihilism through its world design and gameplay. If anything, it is to say how good I think GTA 4 was at balancing both the moment-to-moment -moment writing, the gameplay, 
and the wider textual and cultural relevance the game has. And believe it or not, that's all I will say about the politics and what the game has to say about culture. Just to go a bit off script and all the formalities here of an essay, I am making a concerted effort to juggle expressing my personal thoughts on these games and their politics while also juggling a lot of the criticism I get on how I express those thoughts. I am not a professional writer, so I know each video I try out new techniques, new ideas, new approaches to thinking about games, and sometimes I may not always make my thoughts as clear as I want them to be. Okay, my point is, it is very hard to stick to a stringent authenticity of my own personal analysis of media, like I try to do in my writing, and still make sure I am being fair to the media or its objectives. I have written about perspectives in the Wolfenstein videos and the RDR video that I, while not necessarily disagreeing with now, wish I could rephrase. I understand I won't ever please everyone. However, this is me trying to be vulnerable and asking for patience and perspective when I talk about my analysis of what a game is trying to say. I am not working for Kotaku or the New York Times. I am literally just some dude. This is fun for me. I am not immune to criticism because of that, certainly, but it is important to understand my development as a writer. Okay, I'm done. I promise. Let's go back to the game here, because if you want to talk about it or analyze GTA V, you have to start with its most important element of storytelling. It's three characters. Michael, Trevor, and Franklin, despite minor stat differences and special abilities, control the same, move the same, shoot the same, and drive the same. They are all amazingly proficient with firearms, have unlimited inventories, and still, yes, require you to mash the A button to run quickly. Michael, Trevor, and Franklin, despite mechanical ubiquity, do not act the same, talk the same, think the same, or believe the same. For the sake of the story, they are triametrically opposed? Is, is triametric a word? I don't think so. They share just glaringly obvious objections to each other on so many moral issues, yet all share very similar goals and motivations. Each act as an interesting thought experiment on video game protagonists and the way in which the vessel that you occupy dictates the way you interact with the world. Do you, and I'm actually asking you, the viewer, do you act more recklessly when you play as Trevor? Do you drive more motorcycles with Franklin because he owns one himself and prefers it? Do you do more of the supplemental side content with Michael because of his character's connection to his family and desire to make it in business besides crime? It's really a great addition that I think betters the entire game. GTA, as we've talked about before, asks you to consider the perspectives of its characters and why they are acting the way they do. I think that was the reason why Rockstar chose this method of storytelling. Let's briefly talk about how it connects mechanically first. I know the first time I switched between characters and was transported to Michael doing something on his own time in another place in Los Santos, it was an amazing experience that really contributed to the idea that the open world doesn't just exist for you, the player, but actually houses the lives and motivations of a bunch of people. They really nailed the switching mechanics too, and I think that, uh, spoiler alert, really uniquely comes to a cool mechanical manifestation at the ending fight in the smelting factory. Speaking of triametrically opposed, the closest thing to a moral or intellectual center the three have, Franklin, orders everyone in the foundry to take on a triangle-like formation to protect each other from the onslaught of enemies that have accrued over the course of the game. It's a cool physical orientation that places the three physically in their respective moral alignments, but in order to protect each other. Switching seamlessly between the three is not only extremely mechanically satisfying, but it's also narratively satisfying insofar that the three of them finally seem to figure it out in terms of using their individual strengths to better each other. It's a cool catharsis to all the bickering the three do throughout the entire game. And bickering for good reason. These three men are as conflict diverse as Mike Tyson, which is to say not at all. They deal with betrayal and frustrations, extraordinary highs and life-threatening lows. It is stunning to me how many fights these three have. It is stunning to me that the three still remain relative friends at the end. It is most stunning to me that these fights, these interpersonal, moral, ethical, whatever-induced conflicts, feel appropriate and in character every time. The roller coaster of falling in and out is the real narrative pull here. Rockstar does this very well. I'm reminded of the lengths and trials that Nico and Roman went through only to stay such great friends and companions throughout all of their mistakes, and lord knows they made a ton. 
goodness, the subtitle to Red Dead Redemption 2 might as well be A History of Terrible Decisions. Rockstar has figured out how to take characters that mess up, that struggle to be perfectly moral, and put them through their paces to see the strength of the ties that bind. Really, and no disrespect to Franklin, because we will get to him, this is most relevant to Michael and Trevor. The two of them have a graves full of baggage attributed to each other and have to essentially relearn and reprogram their entire friendship throughout the game. It's almost like the exact opposite of Dutch and Arthur in that sense, where Dutch and Arthur knew each other intimately for decades and then underwent a slow, painful degradation into completely different people. Michael and Trevor knew each other for years and had the cord cut all at once, for decades of thinking that one was dead and never to be seen again. Once Trevor discovers that Michael is alive, however, he is forced to essentially understand and get to know an entirely different person, all at once. It's as if Arthur was separated from Dutch at the beginning of the game, and was forced to meet him at the end. Would he even recognize the man Dutch had become? The closest thing Grand Theft Auto V gives me to real, human feelings and relatable emotions is what it says about friendship and about the ways that connections between people can withstand so, so much. I think it will really be the lasting thematic legacy of a lot of these games when you do something like this Book of Rockstar Games nonsense. How do years, decades, lifetimes of pain and torture and betrayal interfere with the simultaneous happenings of love, success, money, and action? What wins out in the end? What is the threshold of killing and robbing that two people can get to before it all falls apart? I mean, just think about it. Every single game we have covered in this book deals with this thought experiment. Grand Theft Auto 4 had literal family being tested. How many screw-ups and disagreements can two familially linked family members bear? Is there a limit? GTA 4 would seem to think not. Red Dead Redemption does the exact same in both games to test the limits of a non-blood-related family. And due to the eventual inflammation of the Vanderlyn gang, maybe the games are arguing that blood is thicker than water. I don't really know if that's my call to make, it's something to think about. Even LA Noir asks you to consider the ways that something like war can test the connections between people over time, and how it will often end up in a single moment of epiphany of having to mutually confront decades of pain and suffering and decide, are we going to survive through this? Sometimes that question is of course asked metaphorically or literally. I really, really, really like this about Rockstar Games that I have played for the series. I think it's awesome, really, and shows a real commitment to this idea of the Rockstar formula, the one that almost everyone talks about in regards to the gameplay, the level design, and the movements of the characters. Consider then that maybe the Rockstar formula expands further than the code of the game, animations, or the missions. Consider then that the philosophical and narrative ethos of the games can be brought back to this idea of connection whether that be family or friendship. Think about all of these games like this and they become a bit more clear in their artistic visions. Which I want to say is great for video games insofar that character connection driven stories work more effectively given the medium's limitations and strengths. After all, you are that character, at least more so than in any other type of medium. The moral alignment of your characters is contextualized through gameplay as well, and it's pretty good in this game actually. There's this real vagary to the actions you perform in this game, especially in regards to the missions given to you by the US government. Oftentimes I was asking, who are we trying to kill? Why again? What did this person do wrong? Where normally that would be a problem of narrative design, it's fully intentional in this game. Rockstar's commentary on the overreach of the US government, while anything but subtle in this game, is made clear to me through its mission design and dialogue. Where normally, like before a big heist, the crew will spout exposition about their motivations and reasons for doing what they are doing, oftentimes that is ignored in the missions given to you by the FIB. It's a cool mechanical and narrative synchronicity that I feel deserves praising really quickly, and really lands the moral agnosticism of our protagonists. If I'm going to criticize the writing for being directionless, then I need to praise them when their rhetoric is made clear and focused like this. This is made no more clear than the famous and infamous torture scene within the middle part of the game, in which Trevor violently tortures a man to transmit information to Michael, who is performing the assassination. Why are we doing this again? Who is this for? What did this guy even do? That guy? With the beard? Shoot him? Okay, whatever you say, Mr. FIB agent man. 
Unfortunately, this scene, the scene that I think actually has merit and direction in its commentary on the overreach of the federal government, is again played off as a joke as the mission descends. See previous chapter of the video. It is a bit of an interesting window into the world of Trevor, although. I think plenty of missions do a lot better at contextualizing his specific form of chaos, but, I mean, let's be real, he is the saddest character by far. He obviously suffers from forms of mental illness, and his most emotionally evocative scenes are the ones where he breaks a little bit, where his insecurities start to show out, and you can begin to see that the vile, violent, and aggressive persona he identifies with is meant only as a deflection from his pain and suffering inside his head. He frequently blames his childhood for his outbreaks and lack of patience, and one can only glean from that information that he does spend a not insignificant amount of his mental energy on understanding and analyzing why he is the way he is. His most vulnerable state comes in the form of his connection to Michael, which creates more of those situations of connection testing that we talked about earlier. Let me be clear, Michael is Trevor's only friend. Anyone else is either afraid of him or is using him. I think this is illustrated expertly with Trevor's love interest, an older woman who crucially reciprocates her feelings toward Trevor throughout the entire game. Is she sincerely in love with Trevor, or is she a master of surviving with mercurial and violent men? I promise you, one could easily make an hour-long video about Trevor. I'm sure that video exists. About his pain and his suffering, about how he had multiple fathers who abused him, about how his mom called him useless, about how, and let's be very clear about this, he has been a serial killer for most of his life, starting with the young boy he killed with clarinet. That is out of the scope of this video, but it is important to note insofar that Michael treats Trevor like a real human being. Not a monster, not a project for therapy. It's not out of fear of being eaten or curb stomped. Michael challenges and appreciates Trevor at the same time, accepts him and fights him. Trevor spent what was ostensibly years and years pushing people away, and Michael was the only one to really show him any sort of attention, let alone friendship or compassion. He genuinely loves Michael. It's heartbreaking. And if Trevor represents the heartbreaking pain of how America can just absolutely chew up and spit out a human being, then Michael would have to represent how the same thing can happen in the absolute opposite direction. If Trevor was spit into the dirt, then Michael was spit into the Vinewood Hills. Both end up losing themselves. Trevor to madness, Michael to hypocrisy. Michael has got to be the least likable character in the game, in so far that he is absolutely, unequivocally, painfully fake. He is the type of person that is convinced that everyone else is wrong and that he is right. No one is quite on his intellectual level or understanding of how the world works, and this arrogance comes with the destruction of his own family. I truthfully don't have a ton of positive things to say about how GTA V deals with Michael's family. A lot of it is lowest common denominator stereotypes that are either sexist, racist, or a mixture of a bit of everything. It's a failure in a series of games that I think excels in its portrayals of family and connections between people. The highs feel undeserved and the lows feel played off as jokes on cell phones or video games or nagging wives. The confrontation of Michael's hypocrisy to Trevor's aggressive vitriol is the main interpersonal conflict of the entire game, and it has years and years of pent-up anger and frustration due to the fact that Trevor was convinced his friend Michael had died in the robbery they performed in 2004. The boiling up of these years manifests itself finally by the grave in which Trevor was convinced Michael was buried. This sequence is very good, and you probably remember it explicitly if you've played through the game before. It is the ultimate climax to the interpersonal narrative of the game, not really the actual narrative of the game. It is a climax of mistaken identity, a conflict of confusion. Not only does Trevor find out the truth of Michael's betrayal, but he escapes just in time for the triad to believe that Michael is Trevor and to attack him. It's a cool moment that brings us back to the intro of the game briefly to cap off what is so complex about Trevor and Michael's relationship, only to realize that they have made it so much more complex for each other over the years. Which again, I'll reiterate, really sells the point that Michael and Trevor's survival, both literally and the survival of their friendship, is so incredible within the otherwise nihilistic and hopeless aura of the Grand Theft Auto philosophy. Which begs the question, how does the third character involve himself within GTA V? Franklin exists as the attempted center between the hypocrisy of Michael and the chaos of Trevor. Does he succeed? <laughs> 
Not at all, but it is clear that he's placed in between these characters as an outsider because he oftentimes grounds them in reality. He will frequently be seen saying, look at you two, or can you guys please just quit, as if to posture himself as the parent between two bickering children. Unfortunately, Franklin is not exclusive to the moral depravity and aggression of your standard rock star protagonist. He is a brutal, brutal man, willing to kill and rob and murder his way to criminal retirement. I think there's a lot of ways one could go with analyzing each of these characters, again, maybe outside the scope of this video, but Franklin in particular is competing against economic disparity, the Venus flytrap that can be organized crime in Los Santos, and a real cultural and moral obligation to his friends left back in his old neighborhood as he ascends both financially and criminally. This is why Lamar exists as one of the most important characters in the game, insofar that he is what Franklin is to Trevor and Michael. Lamar grounds Franklin, and as Franklin becomes more distanced from his life in poverty and crime, Lamar is forced to bring him back to what allows Franklin to ultimately save the three in the end. So let's hop into it, eh? The ending of GTA V. And notice I use the singular form of that word, ending. I understand that both Rockstar and the general player base has confirmed that option C, or Death Wish, is the canonical ending of the saga. So that is what I will be referring to. I say that Lamar is the reason that the three survive because of a very important scene that happens as the game is beginning to wrap up. Oh, oh hey! Hey. What you doing here? I mean, I'm real glad you're here. Come here. Come I can't on. stay. What's up, babe? No, it's Lamar. What that fool want now? It's your best friend. He's your best fucking friend. For real. My best friend. My homeboy, right? My nigga. Man, fuck you. I mean, not like that, man. But no, he ain't. He just another nigga from the hood. Him, stretching all the motherfucking clowns. All he want to do is drag a motherfucker down and live in the past. And this is the future? A big empty house with nobody who gives a fuck about you. Oh well, shit, it works for me, it can work for you, babe. I'm getting married, Franklin, to a doctor, not a murderer. Then what the fuck you doing here, Tanisha? I'm worried about Lamar, you gotta help him, Franklin. Man, that shit is over. Oh, I'm a legitimate businessman now, sister. I'm a CEO, an investor. I'm a Illuminati. I'm a fucking moron, nigga. You a phony fuck. What? I ain't saying you gotta marry the fool. I'm saying he's about to get killed over that deal you and him put on with... Stretcher set him up. Oh, fuck, man. My whole fucking life I've been looking after this motherfucker and paying a price afterward. First, my English lit education would be sad if I didn't mention the poetics of this conversation happening in Franklin's Vinewood Hills mansion. It's as diametrically opposed to his upbringing, and specifically Lamar's, as just about anything. Franklin's actor also does an excellent job at a real-world technique used by people of color called code switching. The juxtaposition of his previous life and his new life conflict here, and ultimately Franklin comes out of it and goes to help Lamar. That moment carries through the rest of the game, and encourages Franklin to take action against unbeatable odds and refuse to kill either Michael or Trevor at the game's end. Without this moment of realization, without Lamar, of coming back to his roots, the three would certainly be doomed. And in that sense, the ending is frighteningly optimistic. Or is it horribly depressing? It's, it's depending on your perspective. I was livid when I first played it on stream. Awful, totally uncomfortable, and poorly matched friends. Absolutely. Is this how the game ends? Perfect. I'm sorry. We get back to the kind of capitalism we practice. What the f- After writing this out, I am less angry, but still stunned at the abruptness of the ending and the consequence-free life that the three ultimately lived. D did you hear that? Consequence-free? Remember when we talked about that? 
That's why I think the ending is at least consistent, insofar that if we have learned anything from the game, it's that these three men live lives that are devoid of accountability. In that sense, the ending is actually this hilariously nihilistic conclusion to the story of three absolutely filthy villains. They really do get to continue on being the way that they are. No punishment. What felt completely unearned and abrupt when viewing these men as the heroes of the story instantly makes sense if you see them as what they are, unforgivable killers and robbers who happen to star in the story. They are not a traditional narrative's idea of a hero, and so they don't deserve the same consequences a hero would, or endings. It's through this that I think we wrap back into why I think that this game is such a perfect end to the Book of Rockstar games. We've talked so much about perspective and about how each character's interpretation of events is radically different than another, both literally but also in the abstract. This game makes this more true for the player than any other. I could easily see a radical series of different interpretations to this ending, ranging from frustration and anger to total and complete acceptance and appreciation for the riding off into the sunset of our heroes. If I have one concrete complaint about the ending, it's that Rockstar Games has this problem I've discovered since writing about so many of their games. It's where the climax is completely muddled within a number of multiple mini-climaxes that prolong the game's ending. The issue with this is some of the climaxes are really good, but with so many of them in a row, you start to get diminishing returns. (laughs) The innuendos here are not lost on me. This is both a product of their complicated and long-form narratives, but also their reliance on so many different multiple quest lines and intersecting characters. I think every game I have covered for this series does this to a degree. It's a small narrative design frustration I've had with these games for a while, and it happens in this one too. I wonder if any of you have ever noticed this before. I still can't shake the feeling that these characters had a lot more stories to tell. I genuinely will miss them, because the unfortunate reality of this game is that it starts to take itself more seriously in the last 20% or so of the entire game's story, and it's a lot better for it. It's then that you get a little bit of that juxtaposition I spoke about earlier, between the hell and the home, between the absurd and the self-serious, the juxtaposition that I think define this generation of Rockstar games. I am going to miss Michael Franklin, and yes, even Trevor. I just wish they were treated a little more seriously. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching the video. This is another after the channel update. You can actually see Sam. (laughs) Say hi, Sam. Hello. I love you. Uh, It is one in the morning. I've been working on this video all day. I took off work today to be able to finish this video. It's one in the morning. I'm eating a literal cup full of noodles um, and hanging out with my cat. It's a sad scene here in the David (laughs) O.Z. offices. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for watching the video. As always, give you a bit of an update with the channel and tell you what's happening. Um, So the first thing is that one of the reasons why I'm up so late and why I worked so hard on this video recently is that this was the first time, basically, I think since my channel's been made, that I've been able to have a month turnaround for videos, which I'm really, really proud of. And it's sort of a... 2020 initiative for for me in in the YouTube channel, Um, which is to say that there was less than a month between this video and the analysis on sex and video games video. And that's really, really hard for me to do because, um, I mean, these videos take a really long time to make. They take a long time for me to write. I care a lot about them. I care about the quality of them, uh, specifically the writing, and uh, I want to make sure they're good. So, um, yeah, really proud about that, and I'm, I'm glad I was able to get the video out. Um, I'm already working on the next one, and I'm hoping to do an even uh, quicker turnaround on this one, but, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. Um, I'm actually uh, doing something uh, a little bit different. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to say it. So if, if, if this bothers you or you, you don't want to know what I'm working on next, then just skip this part of the video or, or just don't watch it. Um, but essentially, the working theory for this video I'm doing is just a bunch of littler micro essays on games that I want to cover that I genuinely genuinely want to have recorded thoughts on and share my thoughts with you on but just don't really have the time for the you know hour-long monstrosities that I do on this channel Uh, and so I'm gonna call it something like the games that make me love games or something like that and it's uh, gonna be eight to ten 
games that I choose uh, that I have had a profound sort of human emotional impact on me, some th stuff that the channel likes to go over. And I'll just talk specifically for like five to ten minutes. I'll write something. I don't know. It could be longer than that on each of those games just to have them written because I constantly want to make videos about games, but I just can't afford to do this huge thing about certain games. So this is going to be my chance to get my thoughts down on a lot of games like that. And then the next one after that will be another, you know, big game analysis like this. So um, I hope you like this video. This is my time in the video to uh, sh sort of shill a little bit. So um, it's really, really important to me that you guys come hang out in the live stream. If you watched this right as it came out, you might actually be able to catch me on YouTube live streaming. Um, but I'm almost always going to be live streaming on Twitch. You can find me there. Just follow. It's in the description below. And even better would be following the Discord or following, joining the Discord. I don't know. I have a Discord server. Uh, the link is down below as well. You can follow me on Twitter, all of the different normal YouTuber type locations. Um, and that just helps me a lot. It helps me grow. You guys know the drill. You've been here before. Just uh, if you enjoy the content, do everything you can to help me grow. And uh, I'll keep making videos. So um, me and Sam say thank you so much. We have a really, really fun time making videos. And I can't wait to keep doing it. So um, see you in the next one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. Love you all.